What are the signs of the times? Two kingdoms are at war. We are in a clash of dynasties. The headlines today seem to indicate that evil forces and the power of darkness are prevailing in the last days against the kingdom of light. The signs are wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters and man-made calamities. Will we be the generation to witness his coming, to witness both a great awakening and a falling away from the faith? How do we fight for the kingdom of light? How do we know how it ends? Let's look at the headlines. Uh, again, I hope you've been enjoying uh, the series. And uh, it's, it's my heart to not add to the confusion uh, of all these things, but uh, the Bible would begin to lay out in your heart and mind these things that are to come. And that's what prophecy is. It's this foretelling of things that are here in the future. And the Bible is... Uh, gosh, it's just full of prophecy. Let me say it that way. Uh, much of it has been fulfilled, and we are now in this interesting hour, if you will, of time where so much still is right here before us. But as you read through the scriptures, you go, it's got to be soon. It's just got to be soon. So uh, if you're watching online, welcome uh, all of you in too. Glad that you're joining us. Uh, that way, I'm mindful that we have many ministry partners uh, around the world. You would be shocked at how many people watch our services regularly. Pastors and their team and parts of their churches uh, gather up. We hear from them, and we're thankful for them. Many of them have um, incredible uh, needs, incredible things they're doing. I, I wake up every morning, and here's, here's a listing of things. Uh, Pastor, would you pray with us about this? And oftentimes I say we've been watching the services, how we're helped, blessed, encouraged, and, and so forth. So uh, I say that, uh, we, we should say it more because it's a reminder there's a whole lot more going on in this moment than just what you think is going on in this moment. And as people are watching this uh, around the world, and even that is things of prophecy. There used to be a statement uh, well, the statement is still in the Bible, uh, in the book of Revelation, how th there's two witnesses that are killed during the tribulation time. And then it says, and the whole world watched them as they were resurrected and taken straight into heaven. 200 years ago, people go, how could the whole world watch that event? And now it'd be, <laughs> everybody takes out a phone and it's broadcast on the internet all around the world. So it, it's, there's just, man, we're living in interesting days. Interesting days. But uh, once again, prophecy is a hard subject. It can be misunderstood. And it's easy to misunderstand. So I'm praying God to help me lay it out for you in a way where there's no misunderstandings. Because it, be, it could be like uh, the little boy that got his grades, went home, had a talk with the father came back to school and told his teacher, now I don't mean to scare you, but my dad said if these grades continue, somebody's gonna get a spanking, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I'm trying to talk to the father and make sure that I've got it straight to give it to you straight so we know who's gonna get a spanking, right? So um, Last week, we took a long look at what I believe is the, the next thing on God's prophetic calendar, and that would be the rapture of the church or what would be his second coming. Uh, there's nothing left that needs to be done, according to the scriptures. E everything is ripe and ready at any moment for him to come. That day is spoken about in Jesus' own words in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 40, and again, the whole message was about that last week. If you're new to us, uh, some last night were new to us and said, we're going home to watch all of them in sequence to understand and help. But, uh, you know, the whole idea, Jesus says in another portion of this same conversation, I'm coming as a thief in the night. Two will be working in a field perhaps one is taken another is left they're just working together and all of a sudden one's gone but one is left two women perhaps grinding at a meal you put it in your cultural context we're side by side at the factory we're working in the retail shop and we're one looks around and go the other one's gone 
One is taken, one is left. The Apostle Paul, speaking of this event, writing to the church of Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, picking up there in verse 14, for the Lord himself, I'm glad he's not sending an angel or anybody else, Jesus is coming himself, himself. He will descend from heaven with a cry or with a shout of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet of God. I'm going to end the message where we're going to begin today, just to give you a heads up on this. We're heading to a wedding. That's where we're going. And the way a Jewish wedding started was a trumpet blast at the edge of town, and the wedding party had their announcement that the, the, or the groom has come. And uh, boy, don't have time to go into all I'd like to say right there, but just know this, that when the trumpet sounds, it's not then time to get ready. It, the idea is be ready. Be ready, because we're heading, he, heading to a wedding. And it says there then that, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Let me take a moment because, again, this is one of those <laughs> places you can get misunderstanding. Uh, dead in Christ. So this is people who died believing that Jesus was the Son of God, died in faith, uh, being, they've been born again, but they died. Paul would say in another portion of Scripture, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So when you die, your soul, your consciousness, your, you know, that, that immediately is in heaven. You're in the presence of the Lord. Jesus also gave a story, not a parable, but a story. He just didn't tell the name of the rich man and Lazarus. He did give his name. Lazarus served and ate the bread that fell from the rich man's table. But Lazarus was a believer, and when he died, he was immediately in paradise, in heaven, and the rich man, when he died, immediately lifted up his eyes in hell. When you die, you're going to one of the two places. Let me say this, and, and uh, Pastor Michael's going to speak on heaven in a, a couple of weeks, and, and uh, I'm going to cede this for him to, to say it again. There is no such thing as purgatory. That is a made-up thing. It's not, not in your Bible. Lots of people think, well, I got a second chance. I'll die, and then somebody will pay the priest, somebody will pray, and we'll do a handful of Hail Marys, and I'll be good to go. You will not be good to go. You will be either in heaven or in hell when you draw your last breath. And the door is shut right there. Now, with that said, Jesus in this story, again, there's so much theology here. This is before the cross. Paradise was, I believe, according to the scriptures, located in a place where the people in hell could see the people in paradise. That's before the cross. It's now moved permanently to the heaven that, as we would think about it in our context. The rich man says to Abraham, hey, send Lazarus to go warn my brothers, my family, not to come to this place. I'm tormented in this flame. Jesus, this is, this is how he answers that. They have Moses and the prophets. And if I resurrected Lazarus to go warn them, they won't even believe if a man was resurrected from the dead to warn them. When he says they have Moses, Moses wrote the first five books of your Bible and the prophets, that's the rest of the Old Testament, that's all they had in the, when Jesus told that story. And what they're saying, is, Jesus is saying is, they have the Bible to believe, and even if I resurrected this other man to go warn his family, a dead man came and face to face warned the family, they still wouldn't believe. And you can easily get the picture. You have the whole Bible now, and a man was resurrected from the dead and told us about it, and still people don't believe. Just wow. So here we have this the dead in Christ shall rise first. A body is still in the ground. If your body, think about this, if you had a real good embalming job, how long do you think it's still going to last? 50 years, 100 years, I don't know. And by the way, would you really want that body anyway? But you're made in his image, and if you, if people just don't really take time to think about this. 
billions of people, there's nothing left of them. They are ash, sand, the very dust that particles that float in this world are the ancients who've already passed away. Who but God could take every molecule of every person and put them exactly back together because we are made in his image. And he's saying, I'm not leaving my image in this world. So at this resurrection, it's a soul coming from heaven because Jesus is, uh, gives Paul these instructions that he's bringing, he's bringing them with him when he comes, meaning my loved ones in heaven are coming to meet me in the air. And he's resurrecting their body and they're going to have a new body and soul put back together in complete wholeness, a complete salvation. That's new information for a lot of people. I know it is. Let's put the scripture back up for just a second, guys. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, every generation hoped it's them. Paul wrote this and goes, hey, I, <laughs> I'm alive. All of us who are alive, we're going to get caught up with them uh, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage, some translations say comfort, uh, one another with these words. It is comforting to me when I think of the people in my own family, pe friends, people that I love. I know it was only goodbye for now. Only goodbye for now. And we're going to meet up in the clouds one day and be in heaven forever. What a beautiful thing that will be. So my message today is simply this. What's next? What's next? This brings us to a natural division, if you will. The church, all those who know Christ as Savior, you and I, if we've put faith in Christ, we've been raptured up into heaven, and so that's where we are. And at that moment, the door uh, of, on the day of grace, the church age, has ended. The day of whosoever will let him come is over, and now whosoever would like to can't. The day of grace is over. The door is shut. Another door opens, if you will, and it's the beginning of sorrows. It is a day of vengeance. That's phrasing that's all through the scriptures. It has begun. It's the tribulation time. My subject next week will be that, tribulation time, the Antichrist, all the things that are going to happen here on the earth uh, that the scriptures have already, they're the headlines of today. Everything is lining up for this even now. I got so excited studying for it the other day, I almost just wanted to come in today and preach that one. <laughs> Don't miss next week, okay? So, natural division. Us in heaven, what's left here on the earth, and what's going on. So today, uh, what, what's kind of next? So according to the word of God, all of us who've been raptured out of this world or have died in faith, all right, we're going to appear before God in heaven in what is called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, here's Paul writing to this church and reminds them this, for we must, how many? All. Everybody who goes to heaven are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in that body God's give you, whether good or evil. The Apostle Paul probably understood this as well as anyone, and he often alluded to this day as led by the Spirit of God uh, to write about it. Paul often compared uh, these moments or the life that we're running and what we're doing, three metaphors. You find it all through his writings. One of them is farming, just planting, you know, sowing, reaping, harvesting, uh, farm, listen, I grew up on a farm. Farm is not for sissies. Farm's hard work. I live in a subdivision now. <laughs> Amen? People fantasize about, oh, I'd like to have a little farm somewhere. Would you really? Right? <clears throat> the farming. Hard work, but there's payoff. The other one is construction. He talked about building all the time, comparing it to the Christian life. And his most favorite was, I just call it simply track and field just a race that is set before us. Let me give you an illustration just of that one, just from his own words. Just notice the phrasing in these verses because you start in the beginning of his ministry and just move it forward. Acts 20 and verse 24, I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. 
if only I may what? Finish my course. There's a race, there's a course that's set out. So uh, the, the ministry I've received and so forth, going forth to the same church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 24, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives a prize? They're all running, but listen, uh, there's, there's winners and losers, right? So run, run. In other words, be about your Christian life to be a winner. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, his famous words there, I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, we don't know. It's not unnamed, but I think from the way it's written, Hebrews 12, 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, think of an arena. Let us also lay aside every weight. If you're going to be competitive in track, you don't throw a log chain around your neck and put weights in your pockets. You get as light as you can, and so you don't want your sin clinging to you. Let us run with endurance. It's not a 40-yard dash or a 100-meter 100, 100 dash that we're in. We're an endurance race. And sometimes we're sprinting, and sometimes we're going for the distance part, but uh, it's the race that is, that is set before us. I, I used to run track very competitively and I know you look at me and go what in God's name happened <laughs> right a lot of, a lot of sin went into this body right um, as you can tell I no longer run track but uh, very very competitive at, at state levels and and so forth and uh, loved all of it and it, as you would know there's a ceremony at the end of of uh, each race and I, I used to gloat and a lot of pride about that. I'd say, well, there's a, I'd tell some of them, even on my own team and other, you know, friends, we, we all knew each other in the communities. We, we ran track because we had to because you had to run track, play football, and I love football more than anything. And I, I would tell the guys I was running against, I said, they're about to have a ceremony. Y'all want to come watch me have my, have my ribbon, you know, that kind of thing, uh, just, just for the fun of it. But you understand, that's a metal ribbon you know, ceremony that takes place. Note this for a second. When Paul refers to the judgment seat of Christ, important wording right there. The Greek word for that judgment seat is a Greek word called bima. And it was a specific spot and place. It means judgment seat. It's in the city of Corinth where he's writing the letter to this church. There was a stone platform that was constructed called the bima seat. And for, uh, all the athletic awards, the city fathers would come out and people would appear before the Bema seat, the stone structure, and they would receive uh, awards. It was usually like a, a, a wreath of some kind, was like a crown would be put up on uh, their heads. But it was also uh, a place where legal issues were addressed. And that's how Paul come to know about it, right? Uh, the preacher was always getting thrown in jail. Uh, this is where uh, he was brought before Galeo and who was the pro-council of Agacha or Achai, A Acts 18, 12. The name uh, Agacha is actually how you pronounce that name. That name literally means grief and or trouble. Paul knew a lot of grief at the Bema seat and a lot of trouble at the Bema seat. And he had also seen a lot of awards given out there as well. So what Paul is saying, just as people are brought before the Bema seat, every one of us are going to appear before Jesus Christ. And we're going to be judged there. So here's a handful of questions. Let's look at them just right in a row real quick. Uh, uh, when will it happen? When will it happen? We don't know the exactness of this because we enter into heaven. Maybe it's immediately. Uh, I tend to think it'll be more that uh, than latter. Uh, but sometime soon after the rapture, we'll be summoned to the judgment seat. Many of you have watched, uh, as I described a while ago, a medal ceremony or the Olympics or so forth. Uh, and it's a ceremony that is, that is taking place, a medal ceremony, if you will. And this is the reference Paul is giving us. And it's awards celebration on one hand, but it's a reckoning on the other, which is an accounting term. There's a reckoning. Uh, so who will be judged at the judgment? The Christians only, because we're the only ones present at that judgment. Only the dead in Christ and those who are raptured out knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, everybody else, 
that's another judgment and in a few weeks we'll talk about their judgment people left behind in the rapture and so forth they're, they're not at this judgment they will be judged according to their sins hear what I'm saying but that is not what we're about so what we will not be judged for is the third question it, it's like the old hymn uh, many of us with a church background grew up singing it is well with my soul I think it's the third verse is the most precious one to me my sin oh the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul I'm not standing before God giving an account for my sin now when I was a, a boy growing up and listen I grew up in a church where things like this were preached about with regularity and uh, I would think about a, an image like this we're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ and if you ever you ever been if anybody shy like me you don't even want to raise your hand right it's like I really am I'm a shy person I remember my mom had lost me in Walmart <laughs> Roy Mack your mother's looking for you come to the front you know I was so shy and my image of this in church was be you know it's like those loudspeakers you hear at a car lot I envision the judgment seat being this way you know, let's see if I can get this just right. Roy Mack, we need you to come to the front. It's time for you to be judged. <laughs> and I would appear, and this big screen came down, and my life played out like a movie. Oh, my every bad thing, every bad thought, every de deed I've ever done, every bit of gloating and pride and arrogance and all the stuff and let me tell you I've had some of it as a young man Woo. all that's played out and you know there's my mom sobbing weeping <laughs> you know you get older you would envision and now my my wife can't look at me my kids or I can't believe that was dad all the people now I've passed her they're looking at well I knew he was that way you know <laughs> I figured, I suspected that's how it was going to be right there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you know, heaven's flag comes to half mass. I slink off the stage, you know. <laughs> Boy, there, there we are. That, that literally, that is how I envisioned it would be. But thank God it's not that way. <laughs> thank God it's not that way. God placed my sin on Jesus. And Jesus died for me and removed it from me, as the psalmist said in 103, Psalm, the 103rd division and 12th verse, as far as the east is from the west, that, those will never touch. That's infinity. My sin has been removed infinity from me. We don't even have a mind to understand that. So far, he's removed our transgressions or our sin from us. Colossians chapter 2 in verse 13, one of the great theological statements in all the Bible you could spend the rest of your life thinking about those verses and would not do it justice. And you who were dead in your trespasses, your, that's your sin. And the uncircumcision of your flesh means you were a sinner and you were not in covenant with God. You were in your flesh. You were before God dead. You may feel like you're alive and well right now. If you don't know Christ as Savior, you're dead already. You're a dead man walking. You're condemned already. You're in the condemnation until you put faith in Christ. And when you do that, notice God made alive together with him. He makes you alive in the moment that you put faith in him, having forgiven us how many of our transgressions there? All, all of our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How many of you know what it is to be in debt? right and then the people who owe or you owe money to then they go and take legal action and you get a letter then you get a certified letter and you get this or that and you got to go up here somewhere right I mean you, you can just get in a mess well our debt is so great of our sin and so massive we could have never paid it we were we're condemned already we're already under that this that debt of sin he says he set aside 
Everything we've ever done, written and listed, is nailed to his cross. Nailed to his cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, the legal powers of the demonic forces that haunt us about guilt and shame and all that we've done. He says, I've taken, your, this, I've taken Roy's sin, nailed it to my cross, died in my place. I've disarmed those who are coming after you. And I've put them in open shame. Well, I was in shame about my debt, but now the demons and Satan himself is, they're ashamed because they have no authority over me. Man, that's a mouthful. So then, next question, what will we be judged for if not for our sin? Simply saying, our stewardship. Let me put it in just a phrase. What did you do with what you were given? A healthy body or broken body? Doesn't matter. You, God gave you life. What did you do with it? What did he do with the resources? What do you do with the resources God gave you? What do you do with the gifts and the talents and the abilities? Did you just serve self, serve the world, make money and worship your little idol over here? And then you come to faith, but you still kind of played around in the world? Or did you serve God with all that he gave you? And that will be so much of what our judgment will be. Our motives, our attitude, our ambitions all come into play here. Everything. Notice in 1 Corinthians 3, there are two kinds of builders that are described. Remember I said it's farmers, builders, and track and field, sometimes even boxers. But those are the metaphors Paul always talked about throughout his, throughout his ministry. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder. So we're talking about a contractor now. Paul said, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. If you know Christ Jesus as Savior, that's your foundation. Let me say this, that's a perfect foundation. But now you're going to build on the foundation. My wife and I have built a lot of houses through, through the years. We both had real estate backgrounds and kind of filled up empty spots sometimes financially doing that. Built a lot of homes in the Atlanta area. I should say my wife did most of that. Hired the contractors, did all the stuff with that. Uh, we would show up at job sites uh, on a daily basis because you have to. Because if you leave sometimes a, a builder alone, he, how do you say it? He'll cut a corner. And you better, I'd, I'd get the square out every now and again and a plumb line and go, okay, who framed this? Because it's, we had a level foundation, but, and by the way, if you start building crooked, it don't get right as it goes. You have to just take it down. And here's the famous thing about a lot of contractors. The next guy will get it. Oh, the plumber will get that. Electrician will get that. Oh, the, the painter will fix that gap right there. The, you know, the roofer will take care of it. By the, you know, the end of it, we built all the way up and roofed the place, and it's... <laughs> It doesn't get right. You have to be careful how you build as you move forward. So watch now in the scripture here, if you see it in verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, if you take what God has laid, which are those things, and you put wood, hay, and straw, well, each one's work will be manifest for the day. What day? The judgment day. The day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done if the work that is built has been built on the foundation survives he'll receive a reward if anyone's work is burned up he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved but only as by fire kind of I got saved and it was fire insurance gold silver and precious stones are products of creation wood hay and stubble are natural products natural products uh, result of natural growth. Precious stones are a result of the, spiritually speaking, a result of the Spirit of God working through the believer's life. While the wood, hay, and stubble represent what we could do in our natural talent, ability, and so forth, our old nature. 
let me say carefully, no one, I, and hear me, we're all sinful people. We all get messed up at times. No one is going to only and always build completely with gold and silver and precious stones. Everything we do for God will have a little bit of stubble in it and a little bit of straw. And God help us, some people have only built with wood, hay, and stubble. That's all, that's all they've ever done. But according to verse 13 right there, the day is going to disclose it. When you drive through places like um, up in Amish country, I've noticed something they do, a few of them do, that I had only ever seen before in places like Eastern Europe, like Romania and so forth, where uh, <laughs> the communists didn't allow anybody, you know, they'd have one tractor and six farmers share it, uh, no baling equipment, so they'd put a pole in the ground and they would stack hay around the pole. How many of you have seen that up here in our area? Yeah, a few of you live over there, I see. Uh, a big, tall pole, and you fork hay on it and make an enormous haystack. And then it dries, you know, there, and they'll come and take it off that uh, pole the same way. Here's the idea. You're driving, and, and I'm fascinated with stuff like that. Anyway, I, I'll see that out of the corner of my eye because how do you miss? It's a, you know, 14-foot tall haystack and a hundred of them I mean it's wow that's impressive that's not the way you examine gold and silver and precious stones you have to get them up close and look at them there's a lot that we do for God uh, I should say it this way there's a lot that we do that we think we're doing for God that looks pretty impressive even at a distance but you get up to it and you go oh it's just a haystack and a haystack will burn like that. You see a hay barn go up, buddy. Burns quick, like gas. Burn and gone. But precious stones, if you examine them, well, you get the glass out and you look at it. Oh, that's beautiful. That's worth something right there. There's a lot done for God that the world and the, even the church doesn't know. We don't even think about it. We just see everybody's big old haystack somewhere and go, wow, that's impressive. But is it before God? Is it before God? Now, I feel like there's uh, great value in pointing something out here. We're in heaven when this happens. And I'm going to say it more personal. We're home. Home. We've gone home and the door's been shut. And even Dorothy said, there's no place like home. We're in God's house. We're redeemed. We're in new bodies. The curse of sin has no more effect on our lives. We don't stand at this judgment and go, oh, I'm jealous. Oh, I'm envious. I feel shame. All, uh, no, all that's removed. All that's removed. I do, however, believe for those moments perhaps we will feel regret when a lot of what we thought we did for God we realized was for self and it's just burned up I think there'll be a lot of big haystacks that are just burned up we will see others Whew. in fact we'll see millions of others who labored in hard times in cruel time periods under communism or under the Romans or some other cruel group of people and they gave their lives as martyrs they were impaled and set afire to light the stadium where other Christians are fed to lions for the sport of it we see those things happen and it's all revealed at the judgment seat and we're over here going, should we tithe on our gross or our net? <laughs> that's, that's our big burden today, right? We'll see people who suffered hardships, missionaries. They labored behind closed doors. Their secret prayer life redrew the world map spiritually. And we'll realize, oh, we only prayed in public or at meals. And the overwhelming thought for all of us when we see him, hear what I'm saying, when we see the reality of him 
and the reality of heaven and realize such a temporary place. We were all just passing through and now I see my Savior face to face and I am before him. You know what every one of us are going to wish at that moment? I wish I had given him everything. Everything. The last question, and it'll have a few answers to it. So what will we be rewarded, or what will the reward be? Well, I think the first here from Jesus, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But that's not a default statement, by the way. If you've not done well, then you're not going to hear well done. You got to first do well. You got to run the race right. You got to build right. You got to plant, weed, move rocks, break ground, all that stuff, and harvest for the Lord Jesus Christ to hear, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, in the context of that verse, is where Jesus said, and I'll just go ahead and say, he, he's, the, he's the master who gave one servant five talents, one three, and one one, and said, I'm going to go on a journey, and when I come back, there will be a reckoning. It's exactly what he's talking about here. One guy went and invested and worked and did the other. The other guy did the same, even though he had less. And the one who had one went and hid it in the, in the earth, the ground, the world, and did nothing. Are you taking what God has given you and putting it in the basement or just living for yourself? Does everything you get in this world you think is just for you? Or is there others around you that need the blessing and the help and the encouragement? And God is saying, I want to do that for you, but it's not just for you, it's for others. We're the most selfish, consumed people, a group of Christian people in the West there's ever been. We've made, we've made the blessing our idol instead of the blesser. If you do well what he's given you, you get to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. To receive a crown. The reward is a crown, which the scriptures tell us we'll later cast at his feet. Who, who's going to stand before Jesus with a crown on your dumb head? <laughs> Amen? In front of the king of kings? Get that off me. Right? However, the scriptures do tell us there are five crowns. If you have interest, I'd like to tell them to you. The first one, nobody wants. <laughs> the crown of life, martyr's crown. I'm going to give you references for time's sake. I can't read all of them. We'll touch them. James 1.12 speaks of it. Revelation 2.10 is the depth of it. Those, you know, hey, don't fear those who can come take you, your life, right? <laughs> Uh, they're going to throw you in prison. They're going to do all kinds of stuff. You're going to be tested. You're going to be in tribulation. And again, I'll give the context of this in a coming message. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Lots of people, even in this current day, are giving their lives. One of the stories that stuck out to me when I first went into Romania and I met a, a pastor there. He's still alive, good man. And uh, here was the story that he had. He, said he pastored with four other pastors, the largest church, church in Eastern Europe at that time, stood through communism. The communists hated him, hated him. He said so a group of doctors came through from London. And he said, my wife had been sick, and they diagnosed her and said, uh, she has cancer. But if we can get her to London, it's very treatable, and we'll treat her. We'll help her. And he, said, he says, there's no way they're going to let us go. And he said, well, let's start the paperwork and just see what happens. And he started the paperwork, and it, just, it was just sailing through. He couldn't believe it. To the point they got everything packed, got to the airport, and the last security point, they handed him a piece of paper for him and her to sign renouncing their faith in Christ that it was all a sham and a this and a that and they were going to use it for propaganda against his church and their people. Sir, what would you do? Your wife standing there with cancer, sign that piece of paper 
and go get her treated and she'll live. And he said, I paused. And he said, my wife took my arm and said, we cannot do that. After all he's done for us, I'll go home and I'll die before I'll do that. And in a few months' time, please know this, hospice didn't come. There's no oxygen and there's no medication. Just laid in the bed and suffered. Their home, I've been to it. Roses were everywhere in that day because she loved roses. He said when she got ready to die, she sat up in bed for a moment, opened her eyes, and said, Do you see him? Heaven is beautiful. Do you see him? And he goes, honey, I don't see him. I can see him. And he has roses for me. And she passed. Not a doubt in my mind. <laughs> There's a, a crown of life given to her. Because she loved him more than her own life. Mark 8, 35, I, I, I'm going to give you my opinion here. I think you might could receive this crown and not physically die. I think there are a lot of people who give up all their dreams and their aspirations because they found him more worthy. Oh, I started out this way. And by the way, most people have to give up something to serve God. If you give it up and serve him faithfully, you lose your life, you find it. The crown of glory, or pastor's crown, is the second crown. It is as it appears. Pastors who are faithful. First Peter chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 talks about that. How you give oversight, how you do it, not, not for this or that, but for the love of the Lord. I also think uh, this is missionaries, this is life group leaders. It's people in obscure spots uh, in underground churches who care for a group of people. I think that a person like that can have that. If you're leading people, discipling people, praying over people, and moving them forward as a shepherd, the crown of, uh, uh, the, a crown of glory, rather, pastor's crown could be yours. Thirdly, I just got to hurry, the crown of rejoicing or soul winner's crown. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20, Philippians 4. Four, verse 1 is your reference points there. All of them speak about that. If you're going through your life serious about the Great Commission, you enter into conversations and relationships with people so that God's Spirit in you may have influence upon them and you have an opportunity to share Christ with them and lead them to faith and you make a lifetime of doing that, that crown can be yours. A crown of rejoicing. Then fourthly, a crown of righteousness is simply this, those who loved his appearing. When he showed up, you, I was looking for you. Amen? I'm so happy that you're here. And that, that this is not just in the moment, it is you're running your race in the course of your life right now in such a way that when he gets here, you're thrilled about it. I told the congregation last night, in fact, I told them a lot of things I'm not telling you and vice versa. If you'd like to hear more of the message, listen to last night's. But uh, listen, everybody in my life that God has given me stewardship of, in other words, everybody that's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, everybody I know knows Christ. I'm here for you and your family and your friends 135 men sat here yesterday and 99% of them raised their hand that they had somebody they loved who did not know Christ. I'm here to help. I want to encourage you and help you. Just so, listen, we're soul winners. We go out and do what we do and we're running our course that when he shows up, we're happy. Listen, I'd be praying right now if I had people I love, God, give me more time. If you came today, you do all things well, but there's people I love who do not know you. Give me more time. It's not more time to goof around. It's more time to go be that witness. 
the last crown, the, the incorruptible crown or victor's crown. 1 Corinthians 9 uh, speaks of that. This is a crown for those who practice self-control and the, uh, they discipline their, their body and their impulses and their desires in a spiritual way that they can be uh, uh, effective. As verse 26 says in that text, so I don't run aimlessly. If you went to a track meet and you, you realize there's a track and everybody's in their lane and on the way to the track meet, you meet a guy running down the street for his life out here and he's just running and weaving through a field and you could get him stopped and ask him, what are you doing? Man, I'm running the race. Well, you stupid idiot, the race is over, in the, over here. This is where we run. Not just running aimlessly or as a boxer. Man, I'm a great boxer. I can beat up the air. I'm undefeated that way, by the way. Amen? <laughs> Lots of people's Christian life and activities is just running wherever you want to go. We're, we're doing plenty of running aimlessly in our day. And we do a lot of boxing, but we're not knocking out anything. Wouldn't it be awesome to absolutely knock out the dem demonic powers that grip so much of families in this area? Victor, a victor's crown. He says, I'm serious about this that I don't end up a castaway or become disqualified in some way but that I might win so what kind of race are you running let's use the metaphors what kind of building are you building what kind of crop are you planting a lot of people plant weeds in their spiritual life and expect watermelons well, I thought I was getting tomatoes. You, you reap what you sow. And if your spiritual life is just reaping weeds and thorns, and well, what do you expect to come up? Daniel Webster obviously wrote the dictionary. That's a smart guy, right? Noted American statesman once said, the greatest thought that's ever entered my mind is that one day I'll stand before a holy God and give an account of my life. Wow. Wow. On the last day, we're not going to be sitting there comparing ourselves with somebody else. There's millions upon millions of people all around, but all you're going to see is him. And by the way, and his presence is going to overwhelm you. His very righteousness will overpower us. And I, it's important that I say this because it, we, it, we could have a holy fear right here it's a fearful thing to think about for me but understand Jesus is a friend of sinners your sin has been removed and he's paid for it he died he loved you so much he died for you so what are we going to feel as we stand before him loved accepted drawn in to his very heart and planted within him that's where you are right now if you know him if I had 10 months of Sundays we could just stay right there loved accepted engulfed in his love again we would say then what we ought to be saying now let's give him everything he gave everything let's give him everything certainly be obedient to him and all that if you allow me five minutes I'd like to quit right here if I had five there's one thing that won't fit anywhere else but needs to be said because I said we're going to end where we started. We're going to a wedding, right? It's a marriage feast. The scriptures say we're going to be seven years in that heaven. Next week we'll talk about in that seven years this world's going to be in tribulation. There's going to be a revealing to this world who they've crucified. <laughs> We're celebrating seven years at a marriage feast. Biblical days, a wedding went as long as the father could afford. <laughs> maybe it's a two-day, maybe it's a week. God said, it's seven years here. And I'm not out of money. We just time's up to do something else. Here we are. Think about that. Celebrate touring heaven how about we sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob a little while? Maybe have a word with Timothy, Paul, 
Did I mention Jesus will be there? <laughs> People that have, have died in your family that know the Lord. Even your family tree hundreds of years before. Revelation 19, verse 6 says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of great multitude. You ever been in a big stadium? Big stadium, and it got to rocking at some sport event? Deafening. You, you, you yell in someone's ear, they can't hear you? This is the scene in heaven. Like a roar of many waters, like Niagara Falls. And like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out. And what are the voices saying? Hallelujah! And it's so many people, it sounds like thunder in the midst of it. For the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Sounds like stuff we sing here. Hallelujah, God Almighty. It's all the stuff we just sang a moment ago. Where do we get all that, by the way? We get it right out of the Bible. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready watch now and it was granted her to clothe herself in fine linen bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints and the angel said to me write this blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true words of God so here we are we're the 12th man at the sporting event amen we're, we're, I mean, it's peals of thunder as we're praising God. Can you imagine that? And the scriptures say there, the bride prepares herself. You, <laughs> listen, you know what it is when a bride's getting married? Even if it's on the cheap, she's still thinking about her dress and her bouquet and the stuff. And if it's a great big wedding, well, the, you know, the bouquet needs to match the napkins and the cups and it's endless preparation. I, two, my oldest two girls got married three months apart. Yes, you can still pray for me over the carnage of financially that was. And I finally sat down at the table one day and said, I'm going to eat my supper, and I don't want to hear one more thing about a wedding. <laughs> Amen? Not one more thing. Because we're talking it to death. It, why? Because there's preparation. The idea is this. We're going to a wedding, and you and I are the bride, how about we not get ready and slop some makeup on, hopefully here at the very end. There's not time to get ready when he comes. You're to get ready now. Get your spiritual hair right and get the makeup right and clean yourself up where you don't stink. Spiritually speaking, be prepared. And then the scriptures say it was granted her to wear, let's put it in the right terms, to wear white. Y'all do know what that means, right? I go to a lot of weddings and see white dresses, and I know too much. <laughs> Let's be honest. Not one of us deserves to stand before God in white. Come on now. All of us. Dave's one of our elders. He was telling me yesterday, he's got to hey, pray for him. It's okay if I say this right. I'm already into it now, right? He's <laughs> a serial killer in the prison where he works. He has a reason to have to go interview him, talk to him. He'd like to witness to him. And I'm thinking while he's telling me, all of us are serial killers. Right. If you've done it in your heart, Jesus said, you've done it. And I'm telling you what, I had lots of people I've killed in my mind, man. I'm just, just, we're all serial killers. Do you think we, any of us deserve to stand before God in white? But he's, the scripture says it was granted her. You and I, the bride, we're, it's granted to us. Our sins are covered. We've been made white as snow because our sin is under the blood. Our sin is covered. And we stand before God whole, whole, accepted. In fact, those of us who were married understand this. We, we kind of look forward to the bride coming, right? We're not perfect people. On your wedding day is not when you're going to point out the flaws. Imagine my wife coming down the aisle and getting down here. Hey, there's some things about you who's going to have to change. 
right? <laughs> it would not be wise. Do you know him? Do you know him? Y'all, I'm sorry I preached so long. Just so much. My heart's so full. I hope you've been helped today with this. May we bow our heads, close our eyes for just a moment. If you attend here regularly, you hear me say a lot of the same things over and over in a time of invitation because a lot of people who've come in new, it's new information for them. But for all of us, would you see it with new light today? Please see it with new light. Understand how much God loves you. He sees you. He sees you. He loves you. You say, well, I'm pretty unlovable. I mean, my heart is like a serial killer. And yet, the Bible says his heart is drawn to you. He's a friend of sinners. And he says this to us. Let's put it in that wedding context. I love you. I'll give my life for you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Would you be mine? And many of us can remember the day we said yes to Jesus. And in a sense, we got engaged and the ceremony is forthcoming. We said yes. It's memorable when you say yes. People today, man, they hire a videographer and they plan a skit and they go to a special place. How is it we can't remember when we said yes to Jesus for our eternal soul? Or it's up in question. It should be the best day of your life. You never forget the day you got engaged. The day you said yes to Jesus. When you've identified that day and you're thinking about that, let your heart rejoice in it for a moment that you're so loved by the Lord. And if you say, Pastor, I, I've not had that day. Well, he's asking now. You say, Pastor, is he really? Yes, he, 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 he's asking me to ask you. That's what preachers do. We proclaim the truth. And the truth is he's not willing that any of you would perish but all of you would change your mind about where you're going. You'd repent and come to him and be loved by him and accept him. But pastor, how do I do that? Well, you, you confess your need of him. He's telling you that he loves you. He loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die in your place. And whosoever will, whosoever should call on the name of the Lord, right? Whosoever will put faith in him, you'll not perish but have everlasting life out of your heart right now if the Spirit of God is touching you and saying the preacher is telling you the truth and begin to pray the best you can ask him to, to be your Savior to forgive you for your sin if you need help wording a prayer let this be the prayer of your heart today you can repeat it right behind me but it's not magic words it's the, it's the desire and faith of your heart where salvation is found but pray like this dear God I do believe that you love me and I confess that I am a sinner and I believe that you died for my sins Jesus I put my faith in you forgive me of my sins I'm asking it by faith the best I know how in Jesus name